All right, well, good morning. Yep, Hello, morning. and welcome sure to the afternoon. Celebration Church Podcast. I was in the car for a long time yesterday, so I'm a little bit thrown off with things. I drove we are about a faith seven hours family-focused church located in Lakeville, Rapids, Minnesota. Minnesota. Uh, in a moment, you will so hear a sermon from one of our pastors. But I knew it wasn't that, so. Anyway, uh, hey, today's week we four of our enjoy series, and, and grow today closer we're talking to God about these messages. Thyatira, um, Today is, um, on the calendar, it's Pentecost Sunday. And now, so for maybe a message you didn't from our know lead that pastor, or you're a little Derek worried Ross. about that. Penta really just means 50, and so it's 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. And so some of you, if you weren't worried about um, Pentecost Sunday being about the Holy Spirit, now you found out it's also about math, and you're just terrified. But... Thank you. That was awesome. Um, I drove a long time yesterday, so my sense of humor is a little bit different today. But anyway, uh, we're, we're so thankful that the Holy Spirit came and gave us power to be witnesses for Jesus. Yeah. Tongues was the evidence that the Holy Spirit was given to us, but the purpose was and is evangelism. Therefore, Pentecostal believers, the church of Jesus Christ should be more passionate about evangelism, about reaching across the street and around the world, telling the good news of Jesus because of the Holy Spirit coming to us. It's more than feeling goosebumps in a church service. It's about being a witness for Jesus, whether that's a cultural experience trip here in the cities, a global missions trip around the world, or in our workplace. Everywhere we go, people need to hear that Jesus is alive. And 31 people agree with the pastor today. That's great. All right. Anyway, let me give you some updates uh, that, that I wanted to share with you. Last week, we prayed for Jack, who leads our food services here at the church and been on staff for over a decade, I think 13 years, and got saved in this church. On Tuesday, he had valve replacement surgery on his heart, and that surgery was almost six hours and uh, went without complication, but there was some recovery time, and so he spent time in the ICU for the last couple of days. As of last night, he finally got moved to a regular room at the VA, and so uh, if you're close, I can share that room with you, but he'll have his phone back today, can receive texts and encouragement or a visitor as well, and then uh, spent a couple more days in the hospital, then a couple days at his brother's house. Then he'll finally be able to come back home. And uh, if you've seen online, the church bulletin board, Facebook, uh, we've got a meal train going. And I think it's just important that we always come alongside people in the church body who are in need of a little bit of help at that time, but especially somebody who's fed us so many times. Come on, we want to be there for him as well. Amen. All right, so thanks for doing that and uh, be happy to share that with you. Wanted to give just a few updates as well. Our theme for the year is a dooth, and that is uh, the word for testify or testimony. And that means God do it again with the same power and authority. And I couldn't wait till scoreboard Sunday, the end of June, to share these. And so last week we ended the service praying uh, specifically for hidden manna, one of those rewards that Jesus said he'll give to those who remain faithful uh, to the end, hidden manna. Many of us in the room can testify that we don't know how God's done it, but he's come through and we've seen him come through time and time again. Amen. And so uh, I want to share a couple of those testimonies with you here today. Uh, we know that we don't give to manipulate God, but we do give when he motivates us. Right, So the tithe belongs to him, but we, we, we say, God, what are you saying to us? What can we do above and beyond? And we have those opportunities that are going on all the time. But I received this uh, email from the Kellers uh, about a month ago, maybe two, but I was just waiting to see when would the Lord have me to share. So Jeff and Rachel Keller help out a lot. And so uh, it goes way back to their time before here at Celebration in 2016. They uh, felt like finally taking that step. And she sent me a picture of her Bible that I'll explain here in a minute. But to uh, trust God, to put him first and finances and begin to tithe. And so Malachi chapter three says, when we put him first and we take it, put him to the test, that he'll actually protect us. He'll rebuke the devourer and keep pests from devouring the crops. And so uh, she had said, we took that step and it started out at a certain amount every week. That was what they're tied, but I'll redact the numbers because it's their testimony and not yours. And so they emailed me, I see what they are, but you know, anyway, uh, they said, you know, it wasn't much and we had breadcrumbs to live on. This was almost uh, nine years ago, 2016, eight years ago. I was in the car a long time yesterday, so math is difficult, all right, leave me alone. I mean, don't, just quit staring at me blankly. I'm like, okay, anyway. They said, we only had breadcrumbs to live on, but God never left us without. We never had a pest devour our crops and our major appliances never failed. Our cars kept on running and our children stayed healthy. God really provided. 
Then three years later, we were challenged by faith again to increase the tithe. This time it was to twice as much as what it had been before. And then more every year by faith, they jumped knowing that, you know, increases will happen. But when it happened three years ago, they uh, increased that tithe. Jeff, Jeff, the husband, a, m- a month later, got a huge promotion at work that they didn't have any idea was going to come. And the checks had been the biggest they'd ever been since then. So now they feel like called again next month, increasing by faith to step forward. And so what I want to say is this, when God speaks to you, number one, do it for sure. But I want to encourage you, write it down. Because you might forget how far he's brought you or what he's helped you to do. And so you can't really see it because you're a long way away. But here she uh, sent me a picture of her Bible. You know, it's okay if you write in there what God's speaking to you and doing. And here we see a note from August of 2016 and then February of 2017. And then later in 2017, becoming debt-free other than a mortgage. And then October 2019. And different numbers and things that God was saying. When you write it down, you'll be able to look back and give God thanks because you'll actually have an increased gratitude because you'll realize how much God has done for you. So don't take it for granted. Write it down and always do what he's asking you to do. Amen? Amen. All right. So we're believing God's going to do that. A couple more cool finance testimonies that happened just this week. Uh, Pastor Josh and Kim, our youth pastors, Pastor Josh, they've been going with just one car for the last eight months. Uh, uh, Kim's car had broken down and they just didn't feel like uh, they had the bandwidth to inquire some debt. So they've been borrowing cars. Family members, friends had been so kind and generous to loan them vehicles, but they were like, that time is coming to an end. And so Pastor Josh was talking with me, just praying. He's like, I just feel like the Lord's telling me to wait. And anyway, fast forward a week ago, uh, Kim was having her baby shower here at the church and Pastor Josh stopped by and somebody there and had said, you know, we just got a new car, but we were going to trade in our car, but the dealer wasn't giving us what we thought it was worth. They were offering us half what we thought it was worth. And he said, you have a car. We need to buy a car. We've been looking to buy a car. And uh, they said, you know what? The dealer was ripping us off. If you'll give us a thousand dollars more than what the dealer was going to give us, we just feel like that's the right thing to do. He said, I'll take it. Now, Pastor Josh, if he's nothing, he's impulsive, you know, but uh, I was like, did you want to see it? Did you want to test drive it? He was like, I needed a car. It was a thousand, you know, so he said, we'll take it a thousand more than the dealer was offering. And so he comes into my office on Sunday morning last week. He says, Pastor Derek, you'll never believe it. Now on Friday, he'd received some other bad news. And he said, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm just a little freaking out. We got our third kid coming in. I don't want to get this other loan. I just, all these payments. And I said, Josh, we'll pray. God's got this and he knows what you need. So let's just pray. And on Sunday, he came into my office just one week ago and he said, Pastor Derek, you'd never guess what happened. I said, tell me. He said, I was, came to the baby shower yesterday. He told me the whole story of these people. And I, I said, I'll take it. So I'm getting a car for just $6,000 and uh, I know where I'm gonna get the money. I said, wow, that's great. So I found the people there in our church, part of the 50 plus ministry. I saw them in the lobby after church. I said, wow, I just want you to know. Remember, we ended last week praying for hidden manna. We don't know where God's gonna do it, how it's gonna happen. I said, I want you to know, thanks for being a blessing to Josh, just allowing him to buy that car at a price that you know, he can work with. And they said, oh, we didn't even tell him yet. This morning in our prayer time, before you preached on hidden manna, God told us, actually, we're gonna give him the car. I said, oh my. And so... I was excited for it. Then he walked up. He said, Pastor Josh doesn't even know yet. I said, oh, okay. And he walked up. I said, I'll leave you guys to it. I looked back a couple minutes later in the lobby. Pastor Josh was crying. They were crying. They were, everybody was crying. And uh, that's what God does. He takes care of his children. When we just do what he asks us to do, right? Sometimes we receive the blessing and sometimes we are the blessing, But we know God always takes care of his kids. And that's our testimony, right? Hey, dude, God do it again with the same power and authority. Now, I want to really increase your faith. This happened a few years ago. It was before COVID. But there was actually a three or four month spell where I think four cars were donated in that three or four months. So I don't know if God does it in the same way. There's two or three more people that you have a blessing coming your way. If he does it differently, then I don't know. But I'm just saying what God does, we pray that he continues to do. Amen? All right. And then also on Sunday in in the lobby, after I left that conversation, I was talking to somebody else in the lobby and they say, you know, Pastor Derek, I need to know from your wife what color countertops, because I'm going to donate, after we talked about the heart for the house, the kids' bathroom remodels, he said, I'm going to donate the cabinets and the countertop for the bathrooms. You just have to tell me which ones you want. I said, I will go home. I will ask my wife and we will tell you what it is you can give to the church for free. And if that wasn't enough... 
We had already scheduled demo. It all happened yesterday, by the way. Big shout out to the seven people that came in yesterday for seven hours and totally demolished all the three bathrooms. It's just down to the concrete, the studs. It's in there, awesome. So that plan was in place. Then on Tuesday, I got an email from somebody. I didn't recognize the name and they said, good morning, Pastor Ross. It was very formal. Last time somebody sent me an email that said, Pastor Ross, we got sued. <laughs> I don't know. but <laughs> It's like, it's Derek, it's fine. Anyway, they said, we recently moved to the area and just started attending celebration. Two days ago, you mentioned donations to renovate part of the church. I work for a plumbing company out of Northfield and we would love to help if there's a need for fixtures, we'd be happy to contribute them. If you can accept donations, we'd be happy to give the toilets and the faucets. <laughs> Come on. Now, so when we called her back, turns out, I don't even know if she's here today, but you know, thank you if you are, but it was only their second Sunday attending celebration. They just felt like the spirit of the Lord moved on their heart. They didn't even know the size of the bathrooms. Kind of wish they were bigger bathrooms now, but I said, they're just single stall bathrooms. We just need three toilets and three faucets. And she said, we'd be happy to give that. So we know the Lord is doing great things. We never give to manipulate God, but we are, when he motivates us, we do say yes, and we see him do great things. Amen? All right, so we thank the Lord for that. And so, uh, you know, so many times I don't even take time to share what's going on because the truth is I've seen so much manipulation in churches and the church world. And uh, when it comes to that area of finances, and I just, I probably shy away from it too much because I just don't want to be accused or perpetuating that kind of stuff. But something does happen when we open our mouth and we give God a chance. We let somebody else know our need. I never understand why people don't mention their need. You know, it's one reason why we invite you to come forward for prayer. We don't put your prayer list or prayer need up on a big reader board in front over your head while you come forward for prayer. But something happens when you open your mouth and you tell somebody else and they agree with you in prayer. I'm just telling you, it increases how often we see God come through and move in people's lives. Because something happens when we declare our faith that this is what we're believing God for, and we're going to see it happen. Amen? Amen? All right. Well, God is doing incredible things uh, here at Celebration, and we went to lunch. I uh, had just such a full week last week and another one coming up this week, but uh, on Monday, went to lunch with some friends in the church that had just come back after uh, wintering out of state. And um, they had said, you know, the, the, they love our church. And they had said, you know, we've been back a couple of weeks, but it seems like the Lord has increased, gone, things have gone to another level in the Lord at celebration since we've been gone. And I said, you know, I've been sensing that too. Last week in the lobby, somebody came up to me. They said, Pastor Derek, I don't want to offend you, but your preaching has gotten better. <laughs> I said, I wouldn't have been offended if you didn't pre-warn me that you thought my preaching used to be terrible. But... <sighs> No, come on. I said, I sense that too. Why? It's, it's no difference in the prayer and the preparation, but there is an increased favor of the Lord right now on our church. And I sense his favor on my life. And I, I tell them, like I tell you, I'm doing everything I can not to mess it up. Which brings me back to these churches in Revelation, right? They were experiencing great things in God. Ephesus and Pergamum and Thyatira and Laodicea and all these places. They were seeing God do great things in their cities. The, the kingdom of God was advancing. They were proclaiming the good news. People were getting saved. Lives were being changed. But something happened. They went through struggles. What happened? They messed it up. So I'm doing everything I can to make sure it doesn't say Celebration Church Lakeville right there in Revelation along with these other churches. I mean, I know it's not. The letter was already written, but work with the pastor here today. It's incumbent upon all of us to be diligent, to be watchmen and watchwomen on the wall that say, God, not on our watch. Are we going to let happen to us what happened to them? We're going to do our best to learn from the letter that was given to them, we're going to say, Spirit, give us ears to hear what you're saying. Amen? So today we look at the next church. It's Thyatira. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. Revelation chapter 2. This is the last church in uh, chapter 2 that we're going to be reading here today. And if you're able, if you stand, let's uh, read this together. And then we're going to jump right into it. There's five points on the note sheet. I'll finish at some point. Uh, no, I ended on time. I just had to land really quickly in the first service. All right, to the church in Thyatira. 
Thyatira. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, whose feet are like burnished Bronze, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service, your perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did at first. Way to go. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely until they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. (laughs) Well, that escalated quickly. (laughs) Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, To you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose on you any other burden except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who's victorious and does my will to the end, I will give him authority over the nations that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces Like pottery, just as I've received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's our prayer today. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, the great revelation of your matchless Son, Jesus. We ask, Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear what you're saying. Help nobody leave the same, but all of us, more like you, Lord Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Grab that note sheet. There's five points today. No sub points, praise the Lord, but plenty of points to go around. I'll give you a very abbreviated history lesson on Thyatira, and then we'll get in on the note sheet. Thyatira was the smallest of the seven cities, but they received the longest letter of the churches. They were a wealthy blue collar city maybe like Pittsburgh used to be or something like that. They had many plumbers and carpenters and that kind of stuff. I mean, not really, but they're equivalent, you know. They had lots of trade guilds, which is basically different unions for working folks. They were known for their workers in wool, leather, linens, bronze, potters, bakers, candlestick makers. No, I'll just, I added that. Clothing manufacturers. And Pastor Dan had explained that it would have been financial suicide to not join one of those local unions. If that was your business, you wouldn't have been able to transact deals because their business deals were often conducted, transacted in the temple. So they would get together and they would make sacrifices to the gods and then they would eat the food that had been offered to them. So if you weren't part of that circle, you would miss out on a lot of the business. Sadly, maybe you've heard of business meetings like this. They even... At those temple meetings, participated in drunken revelries where sexual immorality was rampant. It's at this point I'd like to say how grateful I am that this passage didn't fall on Mother's Day last week. (laughs) Welcome to Mother's Day. I'd like to talk about sexual immorality in the temple. Jezebel, too, while I'm at it. (laughs) Oh... Now, I mentioned that in this passage of Scripture, we read of this woman Jezebel and her repeated efforts to bring compromise into the church in various forms. And I'll get to the note sheet in a minute. Each of the points really uh, is intended not only straight from the text, but I think to, I'm going to try to bring some correction to what I would call some erroneous doctrine or teachings that have been rampant uh, within Christian circles. These are all church words that start with D that maybe you have one thought about it, but I'd like to bring some biblical uh, correction to that because in each of these points, I've seen so often many people manipulate that proper doctrine and because of that manipulation or abuse, other people have avoided them. It's kind of like that with Pentecost because some people got weird when they got the Holy Spirit. By the way, they didn't get weird when they got the Holy Spirit. They were weird before the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit thinks they're still weird. That's true. I'm a pastor. Okay. 
But, but when we get worried, we get scared off because other people have abused or manipulated, distorted gifts of the Spirit. Then all of a sudden we avoid it and what happens? The devil wins because some people messed it up this way and other people avoided it that way and we all missed God's best for us. So the same is true in each of these areas, right? And so often, even when it comes to Jezebel, I've been seeing some of this on, on Twitter, now X, and I heard from some other people in the church. Jezebel's not like a super frequent name in the Bible. Most common, first kings, right? Married to Ahab, and she wasn't a good lady. He wasn't a good king. There were some problems. And then the second place we see Jezebel is right here in Revelation chapter two. It could be a real lady in the church. It could have just been a spirit, a representation of what was going on. But let me just mention a few things about Jezebel at the top, and then I'll get into the note sheet. I understand that Jezebel, you know, in the Old Testament, real lady, I don't know if she was real in Revelation two or not, because it's uh, unlikely to me that a Jewish family would have named their daughter Jezebel because she wasn't a good lady back then. So it wasn't like a name that we ascribe to like, oh, what's her name? Jezebel, praise the Lord. Okay, you know, like maybe her parents hated her. I'm not sure what was going on, but, but what we know is, is there's a problem. So let me just say this. Number one, this is not, somebody say not. This is not limited to women. I just need to just set the course there. I found, I didn't even know. See, I've only been part of Assemblies of God churches in my lifetime where, where we've seen uh, women in all forms of leadership, serving in church boards, pastoral positions, national leadership offices. So I got to, I have to admit to you, I didn't know that as many church people apparently hated women but I've been told recently, okay? So I'm just letting you know, maybe you can, this term, this spirit, this problem with Jezebel wasn't because she was a woman. Which means, it's not like if you're a dude, you're like, whew, I guess I'll see you next week. No, no, no. I'm coming for you too, all right. Number two, this is not, somebody say not, to be used to just label a strong woman as divisive in the church. Now I'm two for two talking about women on the first one, but there we go. I didn't know. Somebody's like, oh, any woman that had an idea was labeled Jezebel in my church. I was like, any woman that had an idea was labeled a leader in my church. So I didn't know. Anyway, so, okay, this is not, somebody say not, something that stopped after the Bible was done being written. Some are like, ooh, Old Testament, New Testament, we're done. Nope, still bringing division, all right? And then here's the last part. This is not, somebody say not, Something we can afford to ignore here in Minnesota, where Minnesota Nice, I'll get to the rest of the body of Christ later in the sermon, but Minnesota Nice gives room for a spirit of division to run rampant in the shadows when we refuse to confront evil behavior. I will when I get to that point. All right, number one. Number one, because I got five points, I gotta keep going. Number one, we need to be delighted in devotion. This is the compliment that Jesus was giving to the church in Thyatira. This is the gold star on their checklist. This is the pat on the back. This is the attaboy, the way to go. You did it right. Jesus, I believe, says we need to be delighted in our devotion. Thyatira is praised for its growing faith in God and service to others. He said, in fact, you're now doing more than you used to. Your level of service in the kingdom is increasing. Or another way to say this is, you are increasing in your kingdom activity. Notice I didn't say, you're increasing in the amount of weeks you serve in the church nursery. Kingdom activity is not reduced or limited to something on Sunday morning. And kingdom activity, I understand, has to do with, because we're all in different seasons of life. My uncle, my mom's brother is a CPA. That's what he does primarily for his living. And uh, his family knows, we all know, for a month or two leading up to tax day, he's not gonna go to anything else extra fun. If you've got a CPA accountant in your family, you know that too. Like leading up to tax day, they're busy. Then there's another time of the year where they're like, anybody wanna hang out? <laughs> 
But leading up to tax day, they're focused. And what, what does that mean? In that season, they're fully occupied so they don't have bandwidth to do much besides sleep and eat and core functions, right? That, that makes sense. They're not going on a vacation on April 10th. And we're like, that makes sense. They're an accountant. Tax day, we get it. What I can't figure out is why we struggle to apply that same logic to other seasons in life. And I'm speaking especially to the church world at this point. Like I can remember when we were younger and, and, and we were having kids. My wife was the one having them, but we were married. So we were having kids and we had three kids under the age of four. Can I just tell you that in that season, my wife didn't have bandwidth to volunteer at the church three days a week. We understand it with a CPA, but then with the woman, we're like, well, what do you mean you're not in the nursery today? She's like, I got all three kids dressed, fed, dropped them off. Somebody else needs to watch them for the glory of God. <sighs> How many people know seasons are not just okay, they're good. So our kingdom activity must be assessed in light of our availability in the season we're in. So this is not to guilt or shame when we find ourselves in a different season. Once your kids leave the house, you may have more time to have kingdom activity. Again, not just about are you a host in a service or something like that, but how often, what are you able to do for the glory of God in your neighborhood, across the street, around the world? We need to make a, a decision or we need to evaluate what is our availability in the season we're in. But what Jesus was saying, I don't think it was just that they were doing more, but in the availability of the season they were in, they had increased their kingdom activity, which by the way, is opposite of what humans are prone to do. Because we're told, no, I've done my time. Like serving in the body of Christ is a prison sentence. It's somebody else's turn. Well, maybe their turn for that, but did you know we don't retire from kingdom activity? God has placed all of us in different places. I used to love hearing about uh, family members on the Olsen side, and one, once they were advanced in age, and uh, they, they were in, uh, I don't know, um, a home, not their own. Um, I want to say old folks' home. I don't know what else to say. You know what? I already said it. It's on the microphone, so. <laughs> they were at another place, and all of a sudden, these pastors began to say, you know what? Now I got a new congregation. They can't leave. They would just wheel down the hallway and start preaching to their neighbor and then somebody else. You've got to understand the availability of the season you're in. And so we're not comparing what we're doing versus what someone else is doing, but it's a personal deal that says, in my availability of the season I'm in, am I increasing my kingdom activity or am I just declining and saying, you know what, I'm going to put my feet up and just take it easy. But you know, it's not just about doing more. Here, the point is to say, be delighted in our devotion. This means it's not just about the work of our hand, but the love in our heart. It's so often when we just focus on we've got to do more, we've got to go here, we've got to schedule that. What happens if we only engage our hand and we detach it from our heart, we get burnt out and bitter. Because all of a sudden we begin to say, how come nobody else is helping the neighbor? I'm the only one on the street that plows their snow. I'm the only one that feeds, I mean, right? We, when we detach the work of our hand from the love of our heart, we get burnt out and bitter but we need to be delighted in our devotion. So we need to be reminded, this is what he says, you have love and faith. So for some of us, we may need to re-engage our hand because we've been sitting on the sidelines getting fat and sassy. Spiritually speaking, of course, you know, I didn't mean to put that on you. I'm just saying like, we do need to help someone else because nothing will fill us with gratitude more than helping somebody else. But others of us, we've just been doing and we haven't been filling our heart with love and faith. And we're gonna get worn out and then we're gonna quit. And Jesus said, we're not supposed to taper off, but we actually are commended when we increase in what we're doing for him. But we've got to be delighted in our devotion. And how does that happen when we combine word and deed? 
So do a self-assessment. If you find yourself, your hand lacking in your heart, do what you can because we need them both in order to be delighted in devotion. All right, number two, we've got to be diligent in discernment. Diligent in discernment. He says, nevertheless, your gold star is done. Now I need to bring a correction. He says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Isn't it interesting that he says your number one problem is not that you're doing something wrong, but that you're tolerating something wrong. So oftentimes, I find myself, maybe you as well, we can say, well, at least I'm not doing what they're doing. But here this correction is saying, yeah, but you're sitting there letting it happen. God will deal with her. We'll get to that in the next point. But the church of Thyatira tolerated whatever was going on. Now, my gift of suspicion, my wondering in my brain, it's not a spiritual gift, by the way, if you're new, I just operate heavily in it. But, but I began to wonder, I'm like, what would cause their church to tolerate somebody who's perpetuating sexual immorality in the church? And I couldn't help it. I began to think, like a Minnesotan, I was wondering, well, maybe she was really nice and the people felt bad for her. Maybe her son played on the same baseball team as their son. Maybe they were friends and they grew up and went to high school together and they were like, oh, I don't wanna say anything. I don't know why, but for whatever reason, it appears their desire to be liked diluted their discernment. And next thing you know, this lady was wreaking havoc in many lives. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the message, we should not misunderstand what's happening here and come away with an improper conclusion about Jezebel and the impact of our lives today. This is not to say, you know, says she calls herself a prophet. It's not that women can't be prophets or prophetic. We actually know that they can. Throughout scripture in the Bible, it actually says he'll pour out his spirit on sons and daughters. So the problem is not that. But by the way, I would also remind you in this point, it's not really the point of the point, but I'm always cautious with self-given titles. Yesterday, as we were up in Grand Rapids, or I was up in Grand Rapids, Pastor Jim Philbeck, our sec district secretary treasurer, he told uh, you know, all the pastors in the room, he said, you know, be careful that you don't have to feel like you always have to tell people you're the leader because the more you have to tell them you're the leader, the less likely you are. So we gotta be careful with self-given titles. And it says she calls herself a prophet. There, there's, but, but women can and should be prophetic. But I think our feelings, and this is what I think is part of Minnesota Nice, this culture, our feelings really get in the way of our discernment quite often. We may even feel like something's not right, but we just don't want to offend them. But friends, uh, or here's what I know. It's not that we want to perpetuate an environment where manipulation can abound, but when we fail to bring correction when it's so clearly needed, we allow deception to continue and spread. And so I, I talk about Minnesota nice because we're here, but the truth is, this struggle with discernment is not limited to Minnesotans. I believe it's a problem in the body of Christ at large. And what I mean is, I choose to believe, I know there's seven or eight that are not, but I choose to believe most Christians want to be nice to other people. I know you're, you, there's seven or eight that are not, but in general, I just choose to believe that Christians want to be nice to other people. But our desire to be nice does not mean we should allow incorrect teaching and rampant immorality to spread. Right? By the way, this is why I also think that abuse within churches is happening far too often and covered up. Because we think, oh, we need to be nice, we just need to forgive. No, we need to forgive and call the cops. Hello, okay, praise the Lord. That was part of my teaching yesterday to those boards. I was like, call the cops and call the district. Call somebody, don't handle it on your own. That's a problem in the body of Christ. 
that we think we just want to cover it. We just want to be nice, but that's not kind or nice to allow abuse to continue and to spread. Let me give you a couple phrases so that next time you hear them, you may go, you know what? Pastor told me to be diligent in my discernment. Here's some phrases that I've said and I've heard that I think are going, have you ever said, well, that's just how so-and-so is. And we excuse their behavior because we just say, well, that's just who they are. Or here's another one. Well, that's just so-and-so being so-and-so. Rarely is that a good thing. It's not like, well, that's just Sam being generous. You know how nice he is. <laughs> they yell at somebody and we're like, well, you know, that's just how they are. We shouldn't allow that to continue to happen. Don't believe the lie that it's kind to allow immorality to run rampant. It's not nice to allow heretical teaching to occur. It's not wise to permit any of these things in realms where we have the influence to bring about change. And if we don't have the power or influence to bring about change in them, we can and should remove ourselves from those environments where evil is proclaimed. You could turn off that news channel. You could unsubscribe from that email. This isn't about a public boycott, but it is about being wise and choosing to only allow good things into your home and not bad things anymore. Be diligent in discernment. Number three, be decisive in deliverance. All of these build on each other right out of the text. Be decisive in deliverance. He says, I've given her time to repent, but she's unwilling Jesus said, so I'll cast her on a bed of suffering and I'll make those who are doing it, committing adultery as well, suffer with her intensely unless they repent. I will strike her children dead. You know, friends, the stakes are quite high. This is why we've got to be diligent in our discernment because when the time comes, we must be decisive in deliverance. It's lives are quite literally hanging in the balance. And it's time for the church of Jesus Christ here in America to quit playing games, to quit coddling sinful behavior. In fact, too many churches have changed the message from come as you are to stay that way. But you see, friends, we must get rid of anything that is not of God, whether her name is Jezebel or any other evil spirit, anything that sets itself up against the things of God must go. Some people are like, Pastor Derek, why are you so serious about all this stuff? Are you sure demons are real? I still don't understand why any Christian would argue in spiritual warfare that demons are real. Like most Christians believe in guardian angels. What do you think you need a guardian angel for if there's no opposition? Like I don't even get the logic there. You know, you're like, anyway, so, but... Spiritual warfare, it's real whether we recognize it or not. And I just think it's interesting here that Jesus says that all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. So it's not just enough to be decisive in deliverance and get rid of outward sexual immorality, clear behavior. Jesus actually says, I'm gonna look at your heart and your mind. In the same way, Jesus gives us time, but if we don't get it out, he'll get it out for us. And it's always easier, it's always better if we take the initiative to say, this isn't of God and it's got to go. But humans, since the beginning of time, have struggled with keeping things that are unholy around them. Look at this in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse seven says, they shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons. What kind of worship was going on? after whom they've played the harlot. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout generations. So you would think we'd have learned our lesson, but we haven't. Goes on, Deuteronomy chapter 32, 17. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods they didn't know, to new gods, new arrivals that our fathers didn't fear. I know you're like, oh, that's the Pentateuch. Moses was mad. Oh, let me tell you about the psalmist. He played a harp. <laughs> Psalm 106, verse 37. They even sacrificed their sons and daughters to demons. All right, some of you are like, that's Old Testament, Pastor Derek. What about when Jesus came? He, he fixed everything. Let me talk to you about Jesus' life. Mark chapter one. 
Verse 39, he was preaching in the synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Mark chapter three, then he appointed the 12 that they might be with them, that he might send them out to preach and have the power to heal sicknesses woo-hoo, and cast out demons. That's what Jesus said. He came to show us the way. Now I know what you're thinking. You're like, Pastor Derek, Jesus came. He fixed everything. Wrong. I mean, like he did eternally. But look at this. Acts chapter 16, the early church. Apostles, men of faith and power. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and us crying out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaimed to us the way of salvation and she did it for many days. Annoying. <laughs> Look what happened. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, he recognized it wasn't the girl. He turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. So after the apostles, they fixed everything. All right, let's just look a little bit further. Let's talk about end times, latter times. Paul wrote it this way to Timothy. First Timothy chapter four and verse one. Now the spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, expressly says that in latter times, Some will depart from the faith. Why? Because they're gonna give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Paul could have written that in 2024. So you see, this was, is, and will always be something we deal with here on earth until all the forces of hell are thrown into the lake of fire forever. But whether it's an unholy demonic spirit or, or sexual immorality that's easier to notice, attitude of complacency, just a person whispering things in the shadows, whatever it is, if it's not of God, we must get it out. Because I believe not only will we give an account for what we do, here we see what we tolerate, what we allow to have happen. Think about it this way in your place of work, your, your employment. Uh, you know, your work culture is less about what you teach and more about what you tolerate. When you go and look down the hallways or in the break room, sometimes you'll see, you know, fancy slogans on the wall with vision statements and core values and all that kind of stuff, lofty goals that we hope to achieve. But you know, office culture, workplace Culture is not built on slogans, but what actually happens and what is tolerated. Like you can have a slogan that says, we're on time people. You can put up a slogan from Vince Lombardi that says, early is on time and on time is late. But if you let people show up at the end of the meeting, Vince Lombardi ain't got nothing for you. Because it's not what we print on a piece of paper. It's not what we say with our mouth. It's what actually happens. You know, the same is true in the church. It's not what we say we believe that other people are seeing. It's what we actually do that people interpret as what we believe. So the problem is not our written slogans. The problem is not our goal sheets. Our problem is not our biblical core values. It's the fact that we're not living them. And so whatever it is, we've got to become decisive in deliverance and saying, if it's not of God, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's got to go. All right, number four, number four. We've got to be developed in discipleship. These are so important and each one builds on each other. We've got to be developed in discipleship. He says, now I say to the rest of you who didn't fall to her improper teaching, who didn't chase after Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except hold on to what you have until I come. I believe discipleship is a missing link in the church in America today. Jack Hayford, a famous pastor who said, Uh, you cannot cast out the flesh and you cannot disciple a demon. 
But what that means is you also need discipleship. You need discipline. You need to just stop it on some stuff. And you need spiritual help on other stuff. And when we ignore either one, that's why I've never understood. People are like, well, pastor, should the church focus more on discipleship or more on deliverance? I'm like, yes. They're both good. They're both in the Bible. We need them to be all that God has created us to be. They're not antithetical. It's not an either or. If deliverance is more about getting bad stuff out, discipleship is more about getting good stuff in. And the more good things of God you put in, the less room you're gonna have for bad things to stay. So it's not either or, it's both and. That's called being a disciple. It's a process of becoming more like Jesus. Both are in the Bible. Both are needed for the believer. Jesus didn't say, you know, we we like to focus on, you know, did you pray a prayer? When did you give your heart to Christ? And that's good, but Jesus didn't say, go and get decisions. He said, go and make disciples. Being a disciple begins with a decision that you're gonna make a change, but discipleship is every day of your life. It's more than just raising your hand in a service. It's more than just praying a prayer with someone. It begins in a moment with that decision, but it must bring about change the rest of your life. Now, here's the problem with discipleship in these days. We're living in a time where there's an unholy belief that screams, I don't need the church. And even if they're part of a church, they scream, you can't tell me what to do. Right, the apostle Paul addressed this a little bit, this idea when he said, you have many teachers, but not many fathers. Teachers can give us information and then we've got to choose, do we want to believe it or not? It's a take it or leave it. It's, it is what it is. But a father, a spiritual father or mother is someone who's invested in our life and wants the best for us. And when they tell us something, when they show us something in the word of God, all of a sudden, it's not about their position of power, but in their care of showing us what is best for us, we make a choice to go with that. You know, I don't know about you, but I've found that the older I, I get, the more I realize how right my dad was. Like when I was younger, I didn't always like it. I was like, why is he mean? He was like, cause I pay the bills. I was like, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> but something happens. The longer I've served the Lord, the more I'm raising kids, I'm going, you know what? I'm not only realizing my dad was right, I'm thankful that he didn't treat me like his friend and he was my dad. Because my friends were like, hey, if it feels good, go for it. If If you're not gonna get caught, why not try it? But it was my dad who was like, you know what? If everybody else jumps off the bridge, it doesn't make it a good decision for you. That's what we need in the body of Christ. We need more people who are willing to say, I'm willing to help you. You know, discipleship's not something that we ever grow out of. But it's a choice we have to make for ourselves. I stand here before you, you know, in the the place that God has assigned to me saying, this is something that will help you, but you've got to choose it for yourself, right? When it comes to church, I can't say because I paid the mortgage. We're in this together. We're all in it together. And we have to choose to become developed in discipleship. I can't require you to sign up for first 30, but I think it would help everybody. I can't require you to go through alpha, but I think it would help you learn some basics of Christianity. I can't mandate that you go to prayer gathering, but I think it would help everybody begin to hear the voice of the Lord. But I can offer those things, but we each have to choose, do we want to be developed in discipleship. Now I remind you, discipleship is not beneath any of us. And we never grow beyond it. In fact, when we become more mature, the longer we walk with the Lord, we don't grow out of discipleship, our responsibility in it changes. You see, when we're new in the faith, we need other people to come alongside, to teach us, to train us, to explain to us the ways of the Lord. 
But as we walk with him, eventually we begin to walk on our own. We begin to consume meat and not just milk. We begin to mature a little bit. And eventually we shouldn't be depending upon other people to feed us, but we should say, what has God given to me so that I can go and help someone else? And here's what I found about discipleship. Nothing will concrete your beliefs more than teaching someone else. You see, as long as you're receiving, it's easy to be like, I don't like that. I don't think this or whatever. But all of a sudden, when you begin to teach, you have to figure out what is it that I believe? Because a new believer is asking questions and you can't just say, because. And what happens is you may have thought you knew, but they ask a question and you're like, we better look it up together. And now all of a sudden, because you're in a relationship together, you search the scripture together and it actually means you're still being discipled by who? The Holy Spirit. Because it's not just about what someone else brings to you, it's what can he speak to you through the word and we begin to help other people. We've got to be developed in discipleship. Fifth and finally, as our time is gone, we've got to be dedicated in dominion. Another word that I think has been misunderstood and misapplied here in our day, dedicated in dominion. Jesus said to the one who's victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. I love that, authority over the nations. And while that's true, because Jesus said it, I gotta tell you, it's probably not like many Americans are wanting or hoping for. <sighs> uh, he wasn't really writing about an American election when he wrote this in Revelation. But it's interesting, right? Humans have always had this same tendency. There's a test of the authenticity of our faith when we get what we've been waiting for, does it change who we are? And mankind has always had this propensity as we're saying, you know, the, the Jews, they were waiting for their king to come and overthrow the Roman government, not just so they'd be free from their uh, mighty hand, but the Jews said they wanted Jesus to come so they could be in charge. And that's how humans, we've struggled since the beginning of time, right? We wait, you know, as we're growing up, when I get older, when I get in charge, when I'm the boss, and what happens, so many of us, if we're not careful, we become just like the thing we fought against. Because we focus so long on what it is that we want and, and it, we need the help of Holy Spirit to not become that which we were fighting against. And Jesus says, if you remain faithful to the end, if we do the will of him till the end, then he'll give us authority over the nations, the one that will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, quoting the psalmist, just as I've received authority from my father, I'll also give the one, give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying. So the question for us is, will we remain dedicated to him even when we receive dominion? Let me, let me show it to you this way. Uh, in Revelation chapter nine, I guess 19, the question I wanna ask is, why are you and I serving the Lord? Like, are we serving him like the Jews who are waiting for their Messiah to come so that we can be in charge, we can have an election, we can do these kind of things, but, but or are we waiting for the one who is faithful and true? I was listening to a podcast yesterday while I was driving in the car for seven hours and uh, Dr. Alan Tennyson, who has spoken here at our church, he's now serving in our national office in Springfield as our uh, theological council, and just giving some updates on some things and he's navigating these times that we live in biblically. Um, and he'd actually shared how Pentecostalism here on Pentecost Sunday, Pentecostals have, um, in our nation, there was a time where Pentecostals actually avoided voting in a national election because they didn't want to be deceived into thinking the ballot was their source of hope. Now, that's definitely not my recommendation to you here today. I'm not saying because uh, we've been given the help of Holy Spirit, we shouldn't do anything. I, but it's not a spiritual responsibility to vote. It's more like a civic privilege. Like, you're an American, feel free to go and check the box for what you believe the most. I'm with that. But we don't put our hope, our eternal hope in that. 
Therefore, he also said Pentecostals have uh, historically believed in a premillennial reign of Christ. What does that mean? He'll come back before the millennial reign. Jesus will come back for his church because it's when he comes back that everything changes. We're not the ones that produce the change in the land. It's Jesus who comes for his church and changes everything and we get to be with him. Does that make sense? All right, Revelation 19. Let me read it to you, and then we're going to pray, because I know we're out of time. Revelation 19. This is what is to come. If we remember, he says, I will give authority over nations, the one who has uh, iron scepter, blazing eyes, that kind of stuff. Revelation chapter 19. He says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him riding on white horses dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. So we see at the end of the book, the prophecy that it's not we who get to rule with the iron scepter, it's he who will rule and we will rule with him. But it's the reminder for us, the motivation, why are we serving him? Is it just because we're gonna get power? Is it just because we wanna get our enemies back? Or is it because we've surrendered our lives to him? And the promise that he's coming back for his church says he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We've got to be dedicated in dominion. Once we get what we're waiting for, will we realize that he's been the prize all along? If you're able, would you stand this morning? I wanna pray, our time is gone, but I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit in these closing moments to help us. Five points from the message, different people gathered in the room, watching online. In a moment, we'll be on our way, but before we go, I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit to highlight in each of us one of these five areas that we would say, "I I need a little bit of help, I need to be more in this area. Some of us, we need to, Be delighted in our devotion again. Maybe we've lost our delight. Maybe we've lost our devotion. For some, we need to increase our discernment. We've just been letting things happen. Needed to speak up. We haven't. For some, we've got to be decisive in deliverance. We've just been allowing some stuff to stay in our lives for far too long. We just need to give it that eviction notice. Others, we need to be developed in discipleship. Maybe as we look at our life, we we haven't increased. Maybe it's been a long time since you've memorized a Bible verse. Maybe it's been a long time since you've walked with somebody else and explained to them the things of God. Maybe some of us, we need to be dedicated in our dominion again that says, you know what? I'm gonna serve the Lord for the right reasons. So I'm gonna ask you to bow your head, close your eyes here this morning, and I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna pause for a moment to highlight in each of us one of those areas And just allow him to speak to us before I pray. This isn't about calling you forward or naming it out, but right now, Holy Spirit, we ask that you'd come with your holy highlighter and that you would make a mark on our hearts. For each and every person, what area do we most need to become more like you? Do we allow change to happen in our lives? Devotion, discernment, deliverance, discipleship, and dominion. We ask that you can speak to us now for each person, we pray. So Father, in these moments, even quickly as the Holy Spirit's highlighting things in our lives, we come to you. We come to you boldly in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. And we ask that you'd help us in our time of need. You know each and every person, their situation, their victories and their struggles. You know everything that's going on. You know what we need even more than we do. And so Father, today I pray that you'd help your children give some courage to act on what they know they need to do. Give some strength 
to change what needs to be changed. Do what only you can do so that we can live lives ready for the soon return of our King. That we won't have to live in fear, wondering if this is the day or if this is the hour, but we can look forward full of faith, knowing that you're coming back for us. And so today, Father, I pray, do what only you can do. Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear what you're saying today so that we can represent our Lord Jesus well until he comes again. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Pastor Dan's gonna come. I think he's got closing announcement for us. If you're a guest, I wanna say thank you for being here with us today. I'm gonna slide out to the lobby. We'd love to meet you and shake your hand and say thanks for being here with us today. Pastor Dan, if you would. We hope that you learned something from this message and are able to apply it to your life. If you gave your life to Jesus for the first time or the 10th time, reach out to us on Facebook or email us at info at celebrationchurch.net. Thank you for listening and we'll see you again next week.